day, colleagues, um, and thank you for joining us. I trust that um, everybody is keeping safe as we navigate life through lockdown. My name is Minty Makapela Nonzele. I'm the Deputy Chairperson of the Black Management Forum in the Eastern Cape, and this session is proudly brought to you by the BMF Women Empowerment Desk. With me, um, I've got the Deputy President of the BMF, who's also the Chairperson of the Women Empowerment Desk, and she is going to be helping me um, with the question and answer sessions. So um, you are going to see a lot of responses from her um, on the chat box. Um, you're also welcome to send your questions throughout the chat session using the chat, um, the chat session that is provided. And then you can also um, ask the questions live um, after our speakers have done their presentations. Without any further ado, um, let me welcome our panelists that are here with us, Dr. Fundi Lenyati, who is a qualified medical doctor. He's a specialist family physician, healthcare entrepreneur, He's the founder, owner, and CEO of Proactive Health Solutions, PTY Limited, which is a leading employee health and wellness company in South Africa. He's a healthcare industry thought leader and the owner of Dr. Fundi Health Digital Channel. We also have the lovely Miss Lizelle Anthony, who's a qualified clinical psychologist. She holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and is a final year PhD candidate at the UWC. Um, she's currently the head of employee health and wellness for the Northern Cape government. Um, the two of them are here with us today um, to help us and share with us on ways on dealing with various challenges that we might find new or um, not so accustomed to during these uncertain times. Um, indeed, for all of us, these are challenging and uncertain times. Um, as individuals, as families, the country, and just everybody around the globe, um, as we fight this pandemic, we now see ourselves um, having restricted restrictions imposed upon us as citizens. And um, these definitely have some unintended but realistic challenges that are cropping up for all of us. Um, most people have been concerned about the health effects and the side effects of this pandemic. Um, we've majority looked on, on the side of the physical and health of this pandemic, that, that what is it brought for us? And, and to some extent, we've, we've felt that we've ignored um, the mental effects, such as the stress, anxiety um, that is brought about by being confined by the lockdown regulations and also um, the fear of not knowing how to deal with it. So um, based on this background, we then decided to find these experts that and ask them to assist us with the strategies and tactics of how to deal with the challenges that may arise. So we're going to start with you, Ms. Anthony, and we are hoping that you are going to assist us um, with issues such as what, what is anxiety? What are the symptoms? How do you know when you um, actually faced, um, when you are actually at the stage of uh, being, you know, anxious and, 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 and when is it that you, you need to seek help? Or what are some of the measures that you can do um, to assist, you know, and to, and to make sure that you are you are coping with with the spirit that we are in thank you thank thank you very much thank you for that warm welcome um and welcome to everybody that has tuned in and that is joining us today uh, it's quite a privilege to be here today and to present to such a remarkable uh, organization as yourselves and uh Thank you to the BMF uh, Eastern Cape, and thank you to uh, Dr. Nyati for inviting me as well. So like you've said, we, we are all in this pandemic together, but we're not necessarily in the same boat because we are all dealing with this in our own um, communities, in our own homes, and we are faced with different challenges um, as we try and navigate this new world. So how do we deal with this? What is anxiety and what is stress? Um, just, just. There we go. Um, so like, like I've said, you know, currently the situation here and, and worldwide is such that a, a majority of countries are currently under lockdown. A couple of million people are under lockdown and sitting at home. And we have our national state of disaster that has been pronounced and more people than, than not are afraid because this is strange waters, it's strange territory, we've never navigated this. 
And what is magnifying the fear even more is the fact that um, this is an unseen and an unknown threat. We don't really know much about this virus. Every day we, we, we encounter new information and, and all of that creates a lot of uncertainty in, in people. So in a sense, this is quite a traumatic experience that we're all going through on an emotional level. And, and it, it's, it's sort of culminating into a crisis in terms of our, if you look at the health situation in different countries, um, and also in terms of our economy and the fears around that. So the the magnitude of the consequences of, of this is, is we're really seeing that on a daily basis and how it's, how it's increasing and how it's increasing in the level of stress and anxiety that people are, are experiencing. So there's a, there's a lot of worry around what is going to happen, when is this going to end, and that... that um, causes a lot of a lot of anxiety as well. So we can really see that this pandemic is quite a disruptive force. It's quite a disruptive energy. It has disrupted our, our routines. Everything that we know as normal has been completely disrupted and, and thrown out of the door and we have to find a, a, a new normal almost. And then we also confronted with rising infection rates on a daily basis. We have a rising death toll. There's the loss of our routine, as I've mentioned. There's the economic downturn. There's epic unemployment rates that we're seeing growing in, in different parts of, of the world. And then we also faced with additional roles. All of a sudden, a lot of us have become teachers and mentors, and we fulfill different roles in our different um, professions. So there's, there's definitely a lot of change that, is, that has come about because of um, COVID-19. And like I said, that, that has really brought about a lot of stress. And when one experiences stress, you have two levels of stress, your use stress and your, your, your de-stress, causing dis-ease. Um, and that can lead to a lot of burnout. And of following burnout, that can lead up to a range of clinical illnesses, mental illnesses, physical illnesses, emotional illnesses. Your use stress is normally... Stress in general is, is what arises when something we care about is at stake. So your use stress is a sort of a, a type of stress that can spur you on, that can motivate you, that can get you to, to, do, to bring about different changes in your environment. And your, your de-stress is more of a, a stress that can bring a sense of paralysis, um, a sense of not knowing, a sense of feeling out of control. When you're confronted with a lot of, of stressful situations and at, over a, a period of time, that can lead to, to burnout, where you're really feeling emotionally, mentally, and physically exhausted, and you feel like you, you just don't, you can't continue. And that can then lead on to um, the physical illnesses um, and, and your disorders in particular. And Dr. Nyati will, will spend some time to talk a little bit about the disorders and how they present and, and the the treatment for, for those types of disorder. But if we look at anxiety, um, one, one thing to, to realize that um, anxiety is a normal human emotion that, that we're all going through uh, from time to time. When faced with, for example, a work problem, when we have to write exams, when we have to make big decisions. So it's a normal part of life. So what we're going through currently is is normal. We expect it to be stressed. We expect it to, to have a level of anxiety and worry and fear. Um, sometimes even feeling helpless and hopeless and lonely and not knowing what's going to happen. So it's a combination of physical and mental symptoms that, that we're experiencing. And anxiety can, can occur on its own as a response to stress, or it can actually trigger a lot of stress reactions. Um, and as a response to stress, uh, when you're in a difficult situation like we are now, when there's a lot of unknowns, it can actually intensify that stress and it can lead to, to panic attacks. Um, and that is one of the things Dr. Nyati will elaborate on um, because panic attacks is something that, that happens out of the blue, that is unexpected, and it can be quite severe, although it's of a very short dura duration, can be quite severe and can cause a, a lot of dis-ease not knowing what, what's, what's happening. 
So anxiety also can be caused by unhelpful thoughts and thinking patterns. And that's when our minds start to fixate on perceived threats and a lot of uncertainties and negativity. Um, but that is that is an automatic response to an unknown situation. So your survival mechanism kicks in automatically and it says, and your mind starts bringing up a lot of um, thoughts, a lot of ideas. And if we don't challenge those ideas, we start believing them. And that is what causes our anxiety to actually increase and, and just escalate uh, dramatically. So it is about, we have to realize that we have to acknowledge, identify those thoughts and try and challenge them in order to lower uh, the level of anxiety that we're experiencing. So important here to notice the fact that it is, it's both physical symptoms um, as well as, as mental symptoms that we could be experiencing. Some of those physical symptoms, and a lot of you might, might actually identify some of this, tightness in your chest, a feeling of being unable to breathe, a lot of muscle aches and pains, uh, headaches, sleeping difficulties, either you, had, you struggle to fall asleep uh, or you find that you just want to sleep all the time, almost like an escape, trying to get away from, from the reality. Restlessness, moving up and down. You find that you're unable to sit down for long. You can't concentrate on, on a project or a task. Um, you, you might be watching a, a television program and, and not being able to focus and concentrate. Um, heart palpitations is, is, is quite common, as well as digestive problems. Tummy upset, um, feeling butterflies in your tummy the whole time, but not as in excitement, more as in worry and fear and something is going to happen. Having a dreaded feeling that something bad is about to happen. So those are some of the physical symptoms as well as uh, sweaty palms. A lot of people have, have get sweaty palms as well uh, and pins and needles that they might be feeling um, in combination with some of the other symptoms. In terms of our mind, and what we spoke about, there's a, there's a lot of um, thoughts that we have that, that goes through our mind all the time. We think all the time. We talk to ourselves all the time. And we don't really realize it. So there's a lot of that happening. And some of them we call, is it, explained that, and that they call threat scanning, catastrophizing, hypothetical worry, emotional reasoning, fortune telling. So those are some of the, the, the thoughts that, that keep on coming up when uh, when we're worried about a situation. We'll go through some of them quickly, just to, to show some examples. And that is when threat scanning, when your mind searches the environment for what you fear. And that is, you can be aware of it and even not be aware of it. Um, so it's when your mind assigns meaning to, to harmless events. So frequently checking your body for COVID-19 symptoms. That's one way of, of, of scanning the threat. Um, another way is frequently checking your email or your phone for news of retrenchments. Um, you know, is the economy going down? What is the, the rent versus the, the dollar exchange rate? So that is threat scanning. It's trying to, to alleviate the threat that, that you experience or that you sense might be there. Catastrophizing is when you, it's a catastrophe. It's worst case scenario. It's saying to yourself, the worst is going to happen. Um, and that is when you, you say to yourself, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be destitute. So it's really trying to, to look at what is the worst that can happen because we're trying to almost prepare ourselves for that. So that is catastrophizing. Um, and then how hypothetical worry. Now, like I said previously, worry is normal, but it becomes unhelpful when we focus on something that is hypothetical instead of something that's practical. So it's all the what ifs that we have. Um, and what ifs is normally about things that we don't have much control of. Um, so if, if you are somebody that, is re that becomes quite uncomfortable and, and anxious in, in uncertainty, and with, when it creates uncertainty, creates a lot of fear and anxiety for you, then there might be a lot of hypothetical worry. And, um, hypothetical is things that you normally can't control. Like I said, what if somebody gets close to me at the supermarket and I catch the virus? Um, you know, what if one of my family members become ill? So it's all the, the what ifs that you might have had. 
um, what if I get fired? What if I don't have enough money for, for rent? What if I can't pay my, um, my car installment? So those are all the hypothetical worries. And the more we think about them, um, the more they escalate and the more the worse our, our anxiety actually starts to become. Emot emotional reasoning, it's when, you, when your mind tells you that your emotions is real. So if I'm scared, if I'm anxious, then I must be in danger. Then I am going to lose my job. If I fear this, then that is going to happen. So you're trying to give, uh, you're trying to justify uh, a reality that might not be there. Fortune telling, when you predict something, when you say, I am going to be stuck here for months on end. I am going to, to uh, become ill. So those are, are fortune telling. One other thought pattern that is actually quite common is, um, is denial also. When we go into denial and we don't want to think about this and say this is not happening. I don't want to think about it. And it, it, it's, it's quite a conscious way of trying to um, alleviate our own anxiety. So having, having said that, um, I think the, the one important thing to realize before we move on is that in uncertain times, stress and anxiety is a normal process. And it becomes very important for you to acknowledge that you are going through, through a difficult period, to acknowledge that, uh, um, put it in words, basically. Uh, say to yourself, I am stressed. I am feeling stressed. And then tune into your body. Do a body scan and notice where are you feeling this? Because a lot of times we're feeling it in our head with headaches, in our, in our, in our jaws. Uh, we start, uh, you know, biting on our teeth, um, in our arms, in our shoulders. We have muscle tension. So it's normal. Acknowledge it. Tune in. Do a body scan. Realize where is this coming from. And then it's about accepting, accepting that this is what I'm going through. And then you start to challenging it. So that's where we get into how to manage your anxiety. When you manage your anxiety, you'll be able to build resilience and bounce back from the uncertainty and bounce back from the, um, from the stress and the worry. Based four uh, things that I'm going to go through quite quickly is your information diet. So what are you feeding yourself in terms of information? Your influence worksheet, what do you have control over? How do you challenge your thought patterns? And then some distraction activities that, that you can engage in. It's a quite helpful ways to, to try and manage anxiety. So what are you, like I said, what are you feeding your mind and how often? How often are you, are you watching the news and, and the television? What are you looking at? You know, uh, who do you interchange information with? Um, the quote, misery lies, life, loves company. Sometimes we, we speak to people who confirm all of those unhelpful thoughts that we might have. Um, and then we need to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop doing that. I'm going to start looking at somebody else who will challenge my thought and help me to, to think differently about things. Not necessarily positively, but help you to think differently about what you're going through. So look at trusted news sources and, and search for uplifting news. That, that, is, that is quite important. We become so accustomed to wanting to know what is happening, what is the latest statistics, uh, how many deaths do we have? And, and a lot of times we lose focus on looking at the positive, looking at uplifting news, looking at um, what breakthroughs have happened, you know, how many recoveries have we had? So look at how do you manage what you feed your brain? Is it mostly negativity? Is it mostly sensationalism? Or is there something uplifting? What is in my control and what is not? And that, that becomes very important um, to, to try and manage your anxiety. How do I build my resilience? Because that is within my control. How do I bounce back? Um, you know, following the latest information and advice, and advice, that is also within my control. So how much of that am I going to, going to do? Focus on what's important to me. Is it my family, my work, building my career, uh, relaunching um, my my um, what what my my company? Um, what is my information diet that is within your control? My routine? Do I get up at a certain time? Do I do certain things on a daily basis? 
Relaxation is within your control. Cultivating connection. Like I said, who do you exchange information with? Who do you cultivate new connections with? Exercise, seeking and offering support, activism, reinventing and looking for opportunities. Those are all things that are within your control. And try and limit the stuff that is, that is outside of your control. Other people's decisions, other people's health, the news, the government's decisions and actions, your organization's decisions, the economy, whether schools are opening or closing, the state of the healthcare system, you know, flights that were cancelled, holidays that were cancelled, um, graduations that were cancelled. That's, that's out of your control. Traffic that's starting, traffic that's not there, new, uh, you know, noise, public transportation, the fact that I'm aging and I'm losing opportunities, uh, the weather. So what, what can I, because when we become so consumed with anxiety, sometimes we focus on everything that's outside of my control and, and we forget about actually building what is within my control. And then it becomes very important to challenge those unhelpful thoughts when they start. Um, a technique that we use is cognitive behavior therapy and cognitive behavior and cognitions are your thoughts. And your thoughts influence your behavior or your actions. So what we, we say is challenge those unhelpful thoughts. Look at the ABC technique. First of all, attention. So when you feel the stress, stop what you're doing and pay attention to your, your inner dialogue. What are you telling yourself? What is your mind telling you? So that's the first thing. Pay attention to what are you saying to yourself. Second one is belief. Do I automatically believe this thought? If I say to myself that um, I'm incapable of getting through this, do I believe that? And then third of all, challenge that. So diffuse your anxiety by broadening your focus. What is the bigger picture here? Um, is this thought that I'm having, is it fact or opinion? Because mostly what we're telling ourselves is opinion and we don't have real proof for it. So, um, so what, what, what might you think if you were feeling calmer? Would that thought have been there? And then you have to discount. So acknowledge the anxiety that, you, that has been dominating your thinking um, and, and let the unhelpful thoughts go. Discount them. Say that is an opinion and I'm letting it go. And then explore new options. What would be helpful to, for me to think in this way? To say that this is a situation that is out of my control. I do not have a roadmap for this. And it does not mean that I am not good enough. That I cannot cope. So it's really challenging this thought. Looking for facts. Discounting if you don't have the facts. And giving it a new thought. The think technique is to ask yourself. This thought that I'm having. Is this thought 100% true? And if not, what, does, what are the facts and what, does, what is opinion? So is it true, number one? Is it helpful? Um, is this helpful to me? Uh, is it useful to me or and to others? This is that's what I'm thinking. Is this an, an inspiring thought? Does it inspire me to, to do better, to build my resilience? Is it necessary? So is it important for me to focus on this thought and to act on it? And, and, and lastly, is this kind? And shouldn't I be kinder to myself? So those are uh, ways that we, we use in, in cognitive behavior therapy to try and challenge thoughts that actually aggravate anxiety to help you think more um, logically about it um, and to look for the proof in it. And that, that actually leads to you becoming much calmer. Distraction, as as I always say that it's a, it's a tool that one uses to just help you get away from that awful feeling in the moment. So it's an effective tool when your mind starts spiraling out of control. But it has to be, it has to grab your attention and in order to reduce the anxiety. Um, if it does that, you will you'll start to feel more calmer, more motivated, more energized. A lot of that is mindfulness med and meditation that you can do. Being mindful in this in the situation just mindful of being anxious if you are stressed and anxious be mindful of that and don't judge that the thoughts say i'm feeling stressed and that that is the the core of mindfulness 
look at, at some type of personal development, you know, look at journaling, putting your thoughts down on paper. Um, future casting is different from fortune telling. Future casting is a positive distraction tool where you say, this is my plan for the future and where I see myself and you put that, that down in paper, on paper. Um, yoga, learning a new skill, a new technique, a new art, workout videos and exercises. And this is, this is just a few examples of distraction, positive distraction um, exercises that you can actually implement um, to assist. So some of the things on how to manage anxiety when it happens in the moment. Um, lastly, before I hand over to Dr. Nyati to speak more specifically about um, disorders, is to really look at your stress resilience plan or your anxiety resilience plan. Resilience is how do I bounce back? How do I get myself back to a situation where I am in control? And, and a lot of what is happening now is that we find ourselves that we not, we're inactive, we're at home, uh, we don't have a, a set routine and, and that can lead to a lot of low mood, low motivation, low energy. And, and that is the best, ground for unhelpful thought patterns, where we start to uh, downplay our, our positivity, we downplay our, our abilities, and we start to think negatively about ourselves. Um, so in order to, to look at how to build your resilience, start a planning practice, plan your day. A daily gratitude practice, look at what are you grateful for. A daily breathing practice, a regular exercise routine in improving the quality of your social connections. We've been speaking about that quite a lot. You know, who do you surround yourself with? Who is in your front line? Who is there to spur you on? Um, so those things have really proven, you know, to help prevent and reduce some of the physical anxiety symptoms that we spoke about. Um, and we can speak about that some more in some of the, the, the question, answer and question sessions when we, when we chat a bit more. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nyan. Okay. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay. Um, I can't see my presentation now, so I uh, I hope I'll be able to see that. So that, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. And Diabuli Sepondwin and everyone else who is watching, um, thank you for making time to listen to uh, Lizzo and myself. Uh, we are indeed, you know, at a time where there's so much uncertainty. Uh, no one knows what tomorrow brings. Uh, you know, no one knows how long this uh, pandemic is going to be. Uh, no one knows how long is the, you know, the lockdown supposed to be. No one knows whether we will be upgraded, you know, uh, to a level three, which is less restrictive, or we'll actually go back to level five. You know, seeing everybody in places like Durban and Cape Town actually not obeying the rules. Uh, and uh, the pandemic is actually growing every day, you know, in, in, in our country. So Lizel has done a good job to create a foundation about what anxiety is. Now, everything that she has mentioned uh, is really about uh, anxiety um, and, 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 and stress, uh, but it hasn't gotten to a point where it becomes a disorder. So my part of the presentation is actually to focus on when anxiety has now graduated uh, from being a normal, uh, you know, emotional reaction to a threat to a point where uh, you actually have a disorder. Now, one needs to define what an anxiety disorder is. An anxiety disorder is a group of mental illnesses that are characterized by intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about situations. And that's exactly the point we're in. However, that on its own is not a disorder, all right? Uh, anxiety disorder, um, you know, 
commonly there are sudden feelings of intense anxiety, fear, and terror uh, that may actually reach a peak within seconds, and that we normally refer to as panic attacks. Now, as opposed to everything that uh, Liz was talking about, defining what anxiety is as an emotion, an anxiety disorder, uh, you now have a significant distress that is related to your anxiety to an extent that you are dysfunctional at home, at work, or even in society in general. So it's no longer just, you know, emotions that come and go, that come and go, but you can still carry on with your normal day-to-day -day lives. In this situation, because of the levels of anxiety that you have, um, you know, then you are now at a point where you are not able to function at home, not able to function, you know, on matters that have to do with work and certainly, you know, in society. And uh, so people who have these disorders, they are constantly, you know, uh, worrying, they are fearing, uh, they are overwhelmed by the emotions and it can actually be crippling to a point where if it is not managed appropriately, uh, it may actually lead to a situation where the person may have to be booked off work for prolonged periods of time uh, so that they can get uh, interventions. And in some instances, if not managed appropriately, it may lead to a person having to exit employment if they were you know, employed. So next slide. Right. So just... Quickly, the symptoms of anxiety are no different to what uh, Lizzle uh, spoke about earlier. You're feeling nervous, restless, uh, tense, uh, especially on the back part of your head. Uh, you know, uh, going to you know, going to the uh, the top of your shoulders uh, because there are some strong muscles there that we call stenocleidomastoid. Um, you know, and other muscles that support the neck. Uh, and those muscles are often affected when you are anxious or stressed uh, to a point where they get so tense and they get to a spasm. And that spasm may lead to you having what we call occipital uh, headaches. Uh, and at that point, you have a sense of impending danger, panic or doom. Uh, and your heart rate is obviously, you know, it tends to be very high and your breathing tends to be rapid, shallow breathing. Uh, you may be sweating, trembling, uh, you may feel weak or just don't have energy, you're feeling tired. And when you try to actually read something, you find that you're struggling to concentrate or think about anything except that which you are worrying about. Uh, and you may have sleep challenges, you can't fall asleep uh, or you sleep too much. Uh, and uh, you may even experience uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, your nausea, vomiting, a diarrhea. You know, when I was still at medical school, before I go for exams, I would always have some element of diarrhea, you know, but after I had written the paper, I would feel good, no more diarrhea. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you may experience your anxiety through, you know, uh, your bowel habits, you know, becoming much more active than usual. Uh, and sometimes you get an urge to avoid, you know, the things that trigger that anxiety. Next slide. So I think the question then is, um, how common are anxiety disorders? And I, I need to always say um, we must separate anxiety as an emotion that most of us have been feeling about the un uncertainty uh, during the lockdown and the pandemic to a disorder where you are now not able to function as a result of that anxiety. Now, in South Africa, uh, the most common mental illness is what we refer to as depression. Um, but second to depression uh, are anxiety disorders. This group of illnesses, at least 3.4% of adults or 3.4% 3, 3 of our population actually suffers from anxiety disorders. So they are relatively common uh, and at times they don't just come alone they may come with a, you know, a, a depression. Next slide. Right, so the question then is, what are the causes 
you know, for one to move from just having anxiety to a point where anxiety is now a disorder that is disabling them. Um, well, there are a number of theories out there uh, about what actually causes anxiety. Um, but uh, most of the credible you know, theories are that something goes wrong in the brain circuits, you know, um, you know in our brains. Um, and uh, where one has been exposed to severe and long-lasting stress. So if you've been stressing for a long time about what's going to happen post-COVID, you know, what's going to happen to my business, uh, what's going to happen to my job, you know, what's going to happen to my family because, you know, I'm the first graduate in my family. I've got, you know, situation of black tax. You know, I'm responsible for the education of my younger siblings and all of those kind of things. So if that level of stress, you know, becomes too severe uh, and you have not used some of the techniques that Elizel has spoken about, then it may graduate uh, and cause imbalance in the brain circuits. Uh, and uh, what we have also found is that um, anxiety disorders, not everybody who experiences anxiety actually gets to a point where it becomes a disorder. Uh, but some people, um, it may run in families, uh, either inherited from one or even both parents. Uh, but sometimes it may lie there dormant, you know, that, sus that susceptibility to having a disorder. Uh, but then when one is exposed to a traumatic situation in the environment, uh, like COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown, that may actually trigger a disorder to those people who are susceptible. Uh, and it tends to be much more common amongst, uh, you know, females than males. Next slide. So, um, therefore, you know, as we are experiencing all the anxiety at this moment in relation to the, you know, the uncertainty around COVID, um, the lockdown, and what's going to happen to our businesses, some people are more at risk, you know, than others. So certain personality types are much more prone to anxiety than others. Uh, people who've had trauma in the past and they, they didn't deal effectively with that trauma in the past, they may be at a higher risk of having the disorder, you know, of, uh, 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 from anxiety. Uh, also, people who are using substances, you know, drugs, illicit drugs and alcohol, uh, especially now that uh, there hasn't been much access to that, uh, some of them may actually be having withdrawal symptoms and that together with the anxiety may actually take them to a point where they actually have an anxiety disorder. Uh, others who already have other mental health illnesses like depression, um, you know, or even some psychotic, you know, uh, situations, uh, they may have an anxiety disorder. So it is important then that as we experience the anxiety symptoms, uh, we then do an audit, you know, a self-audit to say, you know, are there any issues from the past that I have not dealt with, you know, that I thought I had dealt with, you know, is there any other illness, mental illness that I'm struggling with, you know, am I one of those people with a very anxious personality, you know, somebody who's always thinking about the worst, uh, you know, am I somebody who uses a lot of illicit drugs or alcohol? Because if you are then one of those people, then you need to worry that uh, your chances of getting a disorder is much higher than an average, you know, South African. So next slide. So, um, so what therefore is important is that um, when somebody experiences uh, anxiety disorder, uh, they need to be able to say, you know what, let me seek professional help. Because it's unlike when you just experience it, but it has not yet affected your day-to-day. -day. Once it's a disorder, uh, you must seek uh, professional help. Next slide. Right. Now, just a little bit about this. Um, there are obviously many types of anxiety disorders. Some of them you might be familiar with. 
Uh, we've already talked about, uh, you know, panic. So there are people who have what we call panic disorders, where they've got repeated episodes of sudden feelings of intense anxiety and fear. And it may just happen, you know, um, without anything triggering it. And that can actually create a situation, you know, if maybe you are in a mall or you are with friends, you just have that sudden onset of a, of a panic attack. Um, there is something that we also call social anxiety disorder. Um, this is a situation where somebody um, may have intense fear that they may embarrass themselves if they do what I'm currently doing with you. That is, maybe I present to a group of people or I'm asked to talk, you know, in, you know, in front of people in a wedding or something like that. So you find that they've got disproportionate uh, levels of anxiety and fear and avoid things like that. Uh, there are people who are very brilliant, but when you say they must come for an interview, they just can't handle the interview because they've got social anxiety disorder. Uh, there are also people who have got what we call specific phobias, that is, fears about certain objects or situations, and they actually want to avoid those. Fear of heights, fear of closed spaces. So those people with what we call claustrophobia, you know, they have been struggling with being uh, in their homes, especially if they don't stay in big houses, uh, because they have a fear of being enclosed in small places. Next slide. Right. There is something that we refer to as generalized anxiety disorder, uh, where there's persistent and excessive anxiety and worry about activities or events, uh, even things that are normally routine. These people, they get excessive worry that is out of proportion to what uh, they are actually worrying about. There's obviously a substance-induced uh, substance anxiety, which is related to misuse of drugs, uh, sometimes even prescription medication. And there's something called agoraphobia, which is fear of open spaces. Uh, so those kind of people wouldn't go to, um, you know, uh, festivals and, and music concerts because those just bring intense fear. And the last one is post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is something that is quite common here in South Africa because we have a lot of violence, we've got a lot of crime. So a lot of people get traumatized, you know, um, through house robberies, uh, where the Tsotsis will put a gun on your head, hijackings, uh, and maybe you work for a company like the post office where there's often robberies during paydays and things like those. So when you have such an emotional trauma that makes you feel like uh, at that point you were going to lose your life because of the level of threat that was before you. Those kind of people, uh, if they don't deal with that kind of anxiety uh, within a 30-day period, it may actually graduate to become a post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a kind of disorder that was discovered amongst um, people who were in, in wars. And when they came back home, they presented with typical symptoms, you know, of uh, ex re-experiencing those traumatic situations in terms of uh, the dreams, um, or re-experiencing them whilst awake in terms of flashbacks. Uh, they tend to avoid anything that uh, re reminds them of that traumatic incidents, and they also have what we call hypervigilance. You know, uh, they are always on the lookout thinking that it's going to happen again. Now, this is one of those anxiety disorders that can be very, very disabling, and we see a lot of that here in South Africa. The next slide. All right. So um, I've just taken you through broad, you know, uh, information about anxiety disorders, the different types of anxiety disorders, but one thing you just need to be mindful of is that it is a disorder when it makes you dysfunctional. So if you are not yet dysfunctional at home, work, and generally in society, then it is not yet a disorder. But if you feel that it is getting to a point where you are now being impacted negatively in terms of your day-to-day -day function, don't wait for it to be a disorder before you seek a professional help. Next slide. All right, now, 
Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are a number of disorders that are out there. We've got major depression as a disorder, mental health, you know, uh, or mental illness. You also have got anxiety disorders. But as a rule of thumb, uh, people who present with anxiety disorders, the first point of call is to get psychotherapy from a clinical psychologist like Liesl. Uh, this is different to you know, um, depression, where we may give uh, drugs and then follow with psychotherapy. So if somebody has got an anxiety disorder, the first <clears throat> line of treatment is psychotherapy because uh, you need uh, to be assisted to understand the threat, uh, to be assisted, you know, with coping mechanisms, to be assisted in terms of challenging your thought patterns and to be given skills like the cognitive behavior therapy skills. So that is what is important when you have an anxiety disorder. Start by having psychotherapy. Don't rush into having, you know, uh, drugs because the effectiveness is actually more when you combine drugs and psychotherapy, but psychotherapy has to be the first point of call. Uh, if you've got phobias, you know, um, uh, fear of heights, fear of this and fear of that, uh, then there is something that clinical psychologists will train you on, which is called uh, gradual uh, exposure therapy or desensitization therapy. Uh, and sometimes as part of that, they may actually help you to get face to face with the very thing that you are fearful of. And over time, your levels of anxiety about that particular thing, they get to be, you know, minimized. So psychotherapy, first point of call. And after psychotherapy, uh, then uh, pharmacotherapy, which is uh, prescribed drugs, is the next uh, level of treatment. Next slide. All right. So um, I hope I gave you a quick overview about anxiety disorders. Uh, but I think it's a minority of people who will get to this point as a result of COVID. The bulk of the people will be experiencing, you know, a lot of anxiety symptoms, but they will not be at a level where we can actually call it, you know, a disorder. And what is important is to recognize that my levels of anxiety are now reaching a point where they are preoccupying my mind and they are starting to affect the way I think, the way, the way I feel and the way I function. And when that happens, seek, you know, professional help. So uh, I think uh, that's about it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the overview about anxiety disorders. Uh, I think what is important uh, for people to deal with the current levels of anxiety uh, is that we need to build, oh, we need to build agility accept and adapt. We need to build resilience. Uh, and uh, Lizzle has spoken about positive destruction and other techniques uh, that would help us to build resilience, you know, yoga, exercise, and, and, and all of that. And we need to also have, you know, perspective, uh, not allow our minds to actually dictate what is happening uh, with us. So I think that's about all I needed to say. Then a uh, it can be the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Mr. Nyati. Um, we've just lost um, Umis Anthony, and we're quickly going to reconnect her. Um, so yeah. we'll quickly just for a quick ad break um, while we're trying to connect her. We'll be back in a minute, colleagues. Thanks. No problems. I had often understood the BMF to be some form or another of a political organization. I didn't know much about it then. I was very ignorant towards its existence and what it stood for. So what the BMF does is that it mobilizes different professionals from uh, diverse disciplines to start contributing to an agenda for transformation holistically for a better South Africa for all. Um, so this really allows us all to curate our own mission within that umbrella of imagining what it is um, that we imagine for South Africa uh, or I like to say 
well, the exercise of playing forward the South Africa that we all deserve. Uh, my name is Papa Mamlandi and I'm the Provincial Chairperson of the Eastern Cape BMF Young Professionals. Part of the vision of the Black Management Forum is to be the most influential youth organization for young, particularly black entrepreneurs and professionals within South Africa. It is the duty of those in leadership at the moment to hand over the baton of success, but it's our responsibility to run the race and continue on. The BMF also addresses the missing woman phenomena that is currently occurring in South Africa's top bar. One of the ways yeah. in which we develop our members is through two management yeah. development programs, yes, the I Women have. in Power okay. program right. and right. the Young Professional Development program. I'm a millennial <laughs> and you know sometimes you struggle in the corporate um, world whether it be corporate or government whichever sector my journey and experience with the women in power program was phenomenal I learned self mastery you know learning a bit about yourself and how you show up with other people as a manager learning how to manage up as well as manage down so my experience with the program was transformational and catapulted my sense of self-worth and self-confidence and helped me to change my paradigm and perceptions on life and therefore changing my experience of life. But lastly, it also increased my sense of servitude towards the country. The information is in your hands. The responsibility is on you to take it. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Um, we'll shoot straight to the questions um, and answers now. Um, we've got Ms. Lizelle back on the line. Um, the first question we have is from Tuma Dube. Um, and it says, when you notice these thought patterns in someone close to you, how do you make them aware of it and what they can do about it without you coming off as being dismissive of their emotions, which they have reasoned as their reality? Um, the second question is from Ms. Vuyoka Zbangazi. Um, she says, what steps do you take when you acknowledge that someone is going through anxiety? What support do you offer them? Um, another question we have is from Mr. Sia Zondani, who says, how does one assist a group of people, staff, who may be extremely anxious about the current situation that we're in? Those are the questions that we have for now. Um, I'll hand over. Can I pass them on to Lizzo? <laughs> <Sure. laughs> yeah. that's, that's no problem, Doc. Um, can I have the, the, the first and the second question? Can I just, can you just repeat, Minty, please? Okay. Um, when you notice these thought patterns um, in someone close to you, how do you make them aware of it? And what can they do about it without you coming off as being dismissive of their emotions, with which um, they have reasoned as their reality, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, and the question says, um, what steps do you take when you acknowledge that someone is going through anxiety and what support can you offer them? Okay. All right. Um, I think that with the first two are almost linked uh, together because I think just the fact that you are recognizing the fact that somebody's going through a, a difficult time, they have anxiety or stress, that, that's the first thing. You're not dismissive at all of it because you've recognized it, you've acknowledged it. And, and that is normally um, the first thing. And, and then to just show understanding. I think it's to, it's to start a conversation around stress and anxiety. Um, with a person if they're not fully aware of, of what they might be going through. To have certain um, discussions around that in a, in a compassionate manner that the person does not feel that they need to defend themselves or that they need to deny what they're going through. Like I said, denial is one of the thought patterns and, and people might, it might, it's normally the first that we spring to. No, it's not, uh, I'm not going through this, um, I'm fine but realize that that is a way of them coping initially. 
You need to plant the seed by starting the conversation. It will help them to think about it, even if they are initially defensive and in denial. And, and um, just to, in a very understanding manner, keep on addressing it. Um, you could, for instance, say, when you do this, this is how I feel, or this is how I react, instead of saying, you do this. Uh, or say, I feel this when you act in this way. Or I have noticed these things. Have you noticed them? Um, children are also uh, very quick to notice changes in, in parents and grown-ups, and they might even be the first to, to actually point out when there's a change or when mommy or daddy does something differently. Um, and then it's just in a loving manner to, to try and address it. Um, they can let me know if I have um, addressed that uh, for them fully. Um, I think the third question was about how do you address it when staff or group of people feels anxious? Um, I think there, once of, it's, it's important to understand what the anxiety is about. Uh, we all realize that, you know, this is a difficult situation. We've never been in it. So I think it's, it's first of all understand, is it about um, the risk of infection? Is it about safety? Am I safe at work? Um, is it about whether precautionary measures are in place, have been put in place? Do we have PPE? Do we do social distancing? So is it about job security? Will I lose my job? Uh, will I be unemployed? Will I have money? So first of all, understand what is the, the, the real um, anxiety about and then you need to normalize it because everybody's anxious. Um, normalize the fact that we understand that there's a lot of stress and anxiety about the unknowns and the uncertain. Um, and then what you could do on a, pre on a practical level is to try and say, um, is to have some group sessions to try and address some of those uh, fears and alleviate. <laughs> if it is about the practicality, um, try to show and prove that those things have been put in place. So it's about challenging once again the thoughts that there might be that we don't have PPE, we don't have, um, we are not being protected. So challenge the belief, see if there's fact in it. If there's no fact, then obviously you, you've challenged the opinion of people and you've, pro you've provided them with a the fact. But normalize it, be understanding um, and have compassion for the fact that people are anxious. Um, and try and have the group sessions. All right, cool. Thank you so much. But two more questions here. Um, the first one says, um, how accurate are our smart watches in detecting stress levels? For example, increased heart rate, can these be devices used for anxiety? Um, and the second question is, how um, can we remove stigma or the stigma attached to mental health issues? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, I think that the first question, Dr. Nati, I will leave that over to you to talk about the, the science of smartphones. Uh, stigma, stigma is a is a it's a it's a difficult one. It's, it's always gonna it's always gonna be there, but I think we we're starting to move in the right direction. Um, we are starting to to speak about mental illness in the same way that we're talking about illnesses like diabetes and, um, um, you know, hypertension. Um, it, is, it is a normal illness, and I think it starts with self stopping self-stigmatization because a lot of times we feel guilty when we are depressed, when we are anxious, and we start to self-stigmatize, and that actually can cause a lot of the, the other stigma to also, you know, continue or be perpetuated upon us. Um, at this, at, at, so we need to, first of all, realize that this is similar to having a, a, a diagnosis of, of diabetes or a, a diagnosis of um, a congenital heart disease. Um, but it is about continuously challenging these issues, especially in the workplace, if at all possible, to have sessions about it, to talk about it consistently. And not to, um, we, we tend to, to not talk about it. And that is what perpetuates the stigma. We keep it away from people. We don't say, um, I've been diagnosed with, with depression and I'm struggling. Although we have a lot of things in the workplace that says we will not discriminate against that person. But we ourselves don't want to really talk about it. And um, when we do have depression, we know that, 
you you struggle with concentration and to focus and to be able to do your work in a way that that we normally would have done uh, with, without having the symptoms of, of depression, which means you need additional support. But we don't want to ask for the support because we don't want people to, to think that we are unable to do our jobs. So it's first of all, we need to realize that this is just a, a normal diagnosis like anything else. We will need assistance and we need to provide the assistance without um, having any type of, of dis discriminatory action against, uh, against that person. But stigma is it's a difficult um, Can I issue come in, Lisa? Yes. Yes. Yes, right. yes Doc. Yeah. No, I, I think I just need to say one or two things around stigma. Look, um, if one looks at our healthcare system in South Africa, it's generally uh, biased towards physical health. We spend almost 95% of our annual healthcare budget as a country on physical health. And not only that, it's, it's reactive physical health. Now, issues of mental health, um, you know, are not so much of a priority when we look at our healthcare system in South Africa. Uh, and as a result of that under-resourcing, you know, only 5% of the annual budget being spent on mental health, uh, as a country, an average person doesn't really know much about uh, what mental, you know, health is. Now, if we look at mental illnesses as a group, uh, like any other, you know, uh, illness or disease, we, there is the proactive part, the prevention part, and then there is the reactive part, which is the treatment part. Now, as a country, we should be focusing on educating people, creating awareness about mental illnesses. What is mental illness and what is not mental illness? What's the differ difference between somebody who is mad, as in psychotic, who is out of touch with reality, as opposed to somebody who's got an anxiety disorder, which is an emotional disorder, uh, which has got nothing to do with their core cognitive you know, functions, um, as opposed to also uh, depression you know, or even my, uh, bipolar mood disorder. So I'm trying to say uh, in South Africa, we need to pay attention in, you know, to giving people information that would make them understand you know, that there are a number of mental illnesses, uh, but the majority of those, actually a person can be able to need to lead a normal life, uh, you know, and not think that everybody who's got a diagnosis of a mental illness is equal to madness. So that's where the stigma comes from. Number two, uh, we tend to have very few people acknowledging publicly that they are going through a mental illness. And as a result, people don't take you seriously when you say, you know, uh, there is mental illness. Now, I, for one, uh, about just over 20 years ago, I, I went through a divorce situation. And, uh, you know, it got me to a point where I was diagnosed with a major depression. And it took me 20 years up until Prof. Bongani Mayosi was killed. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Prof. Bongani Mayosi uh, 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 committed suicide for me to decide that, you know what, I need to put a face to this thing called mental illness. And since I did that, uh, I'm starting to see more people coming out uh, and actually acknowledging, and that is helpful, because even during the times of HIV and AIDS, uh, up until people like Man uh, you know, Nelson Mandela uh, came out to say, my son died of HIV. Mango Sutu said, Mango Sutu Butelezi said, my son died of HIV. So you need people to come out and put a face and actually show that uh, it has got no levels in society. You could be a doctor, you could be a psychologist, you could be an architect, uh, you know, like Papama, uh, you could be an accountant. Anybody can have a mental illness. And therefore, uh, there shouldn't be any discrimination uh, or stigmatization just because somebody, you know, is going through a mental illness. Uh, interestingly, uh, the University of Stellenbosch, about three years ago, they conducted a study to look at the prevalence of mental illness amongst working people in South Africa. And what they found was that 25%, that is 
25 out of 100 people who are working in South Africa have a mental illness. So, right? That's 25 out of 100. If you take that 25, only a quarter actually seek professional help or even, you know, uh, disclose that they've got a mental illness. So, you've got 75% of people who've got a mental illness who are not courageous enough to actually open up, seek help, and disclose at the workplace. They come to the workplace every day. Uh, they have what we call uh, uh, presentism. They are present but not productive. So what I'm trying to show here is that the issue of stigma is something that needs to be confronted uh, by all of us because it's a reality in South Africa. And for as long as we treat mental illness as a, you know, as a poor cousin to physical health, and also, we are not creating awareness out there in society. We're still going to have a problem around stigma. And people like me who have survived mental illness need to do more to put a face to mental illness. Okay. And then I think there was that last question, Mr. Nyati, about... Oh, smart watches. Yes. yes. Uh, look, uh, the smart watches that you have, your... Um, you know, from Apple, from, you know, Huawei and from Samsung, all of those, actually, they are very good at picking up, uh, you know, a number of indices, including your heart rate and, you know, your sweat levels and all of that. Uh, and uh, I think it is very helpful because now uh, if there is an intervention through somebody like Lizzo, you know, a clinical psychologist, you can then be able to use recordings from last week and see if they are better a week, you know, after that, after the intervention or two weeks thereafter. So they are very helpful, one, in actually raising uh, the awareness about the high levels of stress that a person may be going through. Maybe there's a board meeting that is coming, uh, you know, and you're preparing for that or there's some important presentation that you need to make, it's important uh, to recognize now you are reaching, you are reaching levels that are quite uh, uh, dangerous so that you can do something about it. And there's a number of things that one can do around managing that stress level. So the answer in a, short, in a long way is that uh, those um, you know, um, smart watches that are able to identify moderate to sev severe levels of stress take them seriously because they are monitoring quite a number of, you know, uh, uh, variables within your physiological function. And so you must take them seriously. Awesome. Thank you and, so much. Uh, I would just like to yeah. add on that, please. Um, and, I, and I think in a, in a session when, when um, you know, a client comes and presents that it's, it's quite important information because it helps to, to assess objectively. Uh, but not, but to also note that self-monitoring itself, you know, not to discount that. Um, a lot of clients, all of a sudden, if if you know there's something wrong or they have to take the watch in, they don't self-monitor, and that is just as equally important. Um, so even those people without, you know, smart watches, monitor yourself. You know when you're starting to feel stress. Do your body scan. When the in your body is, is it feeling tense? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? And to write those things down in combination with, you know, the information with the, with the smartwatch as well. It is very valuable information that actually aids in, in the treatment plan and ultimately the, um, the recovery. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, that is, that brings us to the end of the questions that we had, that we sent to us. Um, I'm oh, now going I, was, to I was still expecting more. <laughs> I think I think the slides made the presentation very clear. <laughs> no, no um, I'm now going to hand over to Ms. Tasnim Fredericks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, Ms. Ms. our Deputy President, Ms. Tasnim Fredericks, was going to assist us with the vote of thanks. Um, yeah. She not connect. Um, there seems to be a problem and um, I think we've been on the webinar for about an hour and, and 30 minutes now. Um, yeah. So we we'll take this opportunity on behalf of the Black Management Forum to thank um, Mr. Nyati and Ms. Anthony for your contribution and time. Um, thank you for availing yourselves and thank you for taking the time to prepare and present um, this valuable information to us. Um, so, 
thank everybody who took the time to tune in. Um, and I'm hoping that this information um, will help us and we'll be able to help our families, our fellow staff members, our colleagues, um, and ensuring that uh, indeed mental disorder um, is, 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 is managed properly. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.